Thank you again for tuning in to today's webinar. I will now hand it over to Brian Street, our Executive Vice President at Castle Group. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for uh, joining us on this uh, webinar. There's a lot of things that are happening out in the industry, so we wanted to bring a group of experts together to kind of talk through you know, the difference between uh, property management, uh, bringing on an engineer, and project management. So before we really get started, um, uh, I'm Brian Street. I'm our Executive Vice President of Operations. I'm also a, an engineer by, uh, by degree. Uh, so I've kind of been on both sides of the, the coin uh, as it pertains to this uh, topic. Um, but as we'll go around, I'll uh, allow everybody to uh, get their elevator speech in. So we'll start off with, uh, with Scott from Building Mavens. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Scott Lewis. I'm the president and owner of Building Mavens, and we're a multidisciplinary engineering firm that focuses on existing buildings. And we service mostly condominium associations, and we're working in high rises, low rises, in all different aspects, whether it's electrical, mechanical, plumbing, and structural, and so forth. So I'm excited to be with, with Brian and with Greg and, and Jeremy from Colliers. And I think we're going to have a really exciting conversation about the difference, again, between property management and a, and a, and a project manager. So there's some new nuances there that we're going to get into. Great. Thank you, Scott. And uh, Greg from Colliers. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Greg Um I've been with Colliers here in uh, the Florida market for five years. Um, I am the executive managing director for the owner's rep and development services group, where we insert alongside our clients, a project management office that helps with the capital planning, budgeting, and execution uh, of construction-related assignments on condos, hotels, and commercial assets around the state. Great, thank you, Greg. And um, so today's focus, uh, is Scott and, and, and Greg actually alluded to, is we're gonna talk through some of these big projects. And obviously uh, we have, uh, guests from all over the state of Florida right now. So we're going to talk through what it means to be a property manager. So from, from our standpoint, you know, we provide the, the property manager to help manage the day-to-day -day, uh, aspects of a community and what that means differently than a project manager. And with what's happened with, you know, Hurricane Ian last year, uh, some of the new uh, milestone inspections and, uh, you know, projects that are coming up for our buildings here in, in the South Florida market, you know, specifically, uh, you know, what makes sense to bring on a, an owner's rep or a true project manager? Uh, because as you can see from, from our slide here, there's so many components that go into just getting a, a, a more efficient project. Uh, you know, and we'll, we'll, we'll have a few examples, you know, this doesn't mean just a, a simple, maybe a, a little tile replacement, um, you know, project. This is something that's a little bit more robust, you know, a, a maybe a concrete restoration, a new roof, um, maybe a major uh, mechanical upgrade from your cooling towers and your chillers and your pumps. There's so many nuances that go into a project uh, that, you know, from, from our standpoint, a, pro a property manager just doesn't have the background, doesn't have the, the skills or the education to really make sure that they are working together. Um, uh, on, on a project without that expertise. So from here, and, and one of the things that Colliers brings to the table is providing that, that owner's rep mentality, being an advocate for the association and working with the partners of the association, like a Scott and from Building Mavens, because you're going to need your engineer, you're going to need your owner's rep, uh, and then your contractors. And you have your various stakeholders that are uh, so important in in what we do here so this just kind of goes through quickly you know you have your MEP mechanical electrical plumbing there could be some environmental regulations depending if you have a seawall there could be a few um, uh, items you know mangroves you know how fast how efficient can you get through a project uh, what is the true budget what's the scope uh, and then obviously working through governmental approvals uh, you know and architects engineers and all these various components coming together to make sure that you have a successful project. So, uh, you know, that being said, I want to kind of toss out a couple questions to our panelists. And, you know, Greg, from a project management piece, when should 
you and your firm get involved in, in a project? Really at the earliest stages and, and onset of a project, you know, in the, in the commercial world, if you look at typical building management and maintenance, uh, the property management team really handles the day-to-day -day functions of what has to take place with um, the residents, the community members and everything else like that, and the upkeep of the day-to-day -day functions of the building and their license, they're actually licensed and built around that much like a general contractor or a broker or anyone licensed in their field. Now, in, in a commercial environment, which um, the condo world due to Senate Bill 4D is, is really being forced into that sort of level of benchmark and maintenance to where when we look at, at assets, large condos and buildings of that size, we're looking at it from the capital maintenance plan aspect. So you'll see in most of your reserve studies, um, there's going to be various items that are going to need uh, a team built around it, which is exactly what this picture represents. Uh, they're going to need to consider an architect and everything else that you went through dependent on the scope of work. And the earlier you can define what those budgets and scopes are in the process, i.e. from the validation of a SERS or, an, or, or a reserve study standpoint, um, the more uh, understanding you have, the greater understanding of what those scopes entail, the costs behind them, and then obviously the schedule of implementation is extremely important. So really that project manager um, is your capital asset manager alongside your property manager through the term of whatever those scopes of projects you define your community needs to undertake in a three to five year sort of life cycle. Uh, and that's great. You know, it's an interesting point that you brought up that in the, the commercial space, the commercial towers, it's very commonplace. You almost always have an owner's rep working alongside the engineer for any of these major, um, you know, major projects. And, you know, from the property manager side, you know, a lot of times our boards, uh, you know, say, well, our, our property manager can do that. They can manage a project. However, they don't have that experience. So, you know, Scott, from a from an engineering standpoint, you know, you come in, you know, a property manager reaches out because they need an engineer to um, maybe take a look at the concrete restoration or the roofing project. You're going to come out and you're going to have some some dialogue with the property manager. I mean, how frequently do you run into a residential property manager that can understand the nuances of the engineering report without having some some owner's rep type uh, uh, partner. Unfortunately, it's it's, it's very rare, and, and and I don't think um it's only just an experience thing, but also it's it's a time thing, right? So the the property manager being hired already has a list of responsibilities, and to add management of a major project, which is let's call it a, a full time um, consuming role into the mix, they won't have the attention span or time to really do that correctly. But to answer your question, in, in terms of relating complex information or, or even the real responsibility of the engineer, it sometimes falls on deaf ears because you know, everybody wants more than they really pay for sometimes. So if they hire an engineer to do a, a set of plans and possibly to help with bid services and then maybe do con con construction administration on the back end, they sometimes want more in the sense of, well, why are you, aren't you holding the contractor accountable? Why aren't you sitting in this meeting? Why aren't you doing that? But really and truly, that's not what the engineer was signed up to do or was responsible for given the, the, the actual flow of the project. So I think by putting someone in the mix, and we'll just use Greg's name right now. So by putting Greg in the mix, he becomes that central point where he is now answering to the board about why things may be on track or off track. And also he delivers the intent of the, of the owner to the different parties like myself, where there's, let's call it streamlined communication and nothing really goes out of scope because technically that's what the, the project manager should be doing, holding everybody accountable to, as you sit to the side, the scope, the schedule, the budget. Because if any of those things change, then then it needs to be communicated back to the owner of how it affects the other one, right? And, and your property manager may not necessarily understand the implication of the decision that he's making or the question that, that the engineer is asking. That's a, it's a very good point. Uh, Correct. You know, it's, you know, from, from our standpoint, 
having the engineer come in and start explaining, yes, it all, it all you know, makes sense from moving a project forward. However, when things are actually happening out in the field and the nuances that every single building is a living, breathing you know, entity, you know, the engineer may come back and say, uh, you know, we need to make some changes here. Uh, and the contractor just goes, what about like change orders and, and everything else? Obviously, you know, that we, we've moved a few steps ahead, but, you know, there's a there's a large component of frustration from a board uh, when, you know, all these change orders keep coming in. So, Scott, from an engineering standpoint, kind of talk through, you know, your your role of setting up the repair protocols and everything and why wouldn't you have captured all of these things where the contractor could put a complete scope together of, of what's what's there and what's maybe missing and why a change order would maybe be necessary? And then we'll get into Greg on how we can manage those change orders. Yeah, so with, with let's call it restoration or, or working on existing buildings, it is, I won't say impossible, but very, very difficult to capture the complete scope Right. One, because the cost to do so would just be enormous. And also by putting certain contingencies into the plan, we try to capture as much as we can. But in the real world, what happens is, and I can give a, a real example, and we'll use an expansion joint for, for instance. So we, we let's say we create a, a plan or specifications to replace an expansion joint. And this is a true story, by the way. So we go to open the expansion joint and Portions of it, let's say, let's say the majority of the joint is fine, right? And we open it up, it's the right size. But as the contractor starts to open the rest of the joint, the edges of the joint that we're putting the material in start to crumble, right? And nobody foresaw, foresaw, foresaw that. And now instead of just being an expansion joint replacement for the material, the contractor now has to rebuild the edges of the joint so that we can put the material in. So let's say that line item on the bid now increased by 10 to 15% because of that change. That's a, that's a legitimate change. And that was something that was unforeseen because again, we wouldn't open up the whole joint before we spec the repair but things like that do happen in the field. And, and I guess the communication of that is key and the contingencies in the budget are key to address that. But unfortunately, that's the nature of restoration that we will have unforeseen circumstances that we see. And the goal at that point is to really capture the real amount, the price and relay that information back to the board so that they can make the decision on um, going forward with the repair. So what you're saying, basically it's, nearly impossible and, and from a repair protocol you have the, the the joints but then even from a maybe the stucco on the side of a building you know you're only testing a very small portion of the stucco and that as you start to make those repairs unforeseen circumstances are are maybe elsewhere in the building as you've gone the sounding so those things then come up the contractor brings those up to both the engineer and owner's rep so greg how would you kind of walk through that process on a change order coming, you know, from maybe we'll go for, with the stucco or the uh, expansion joint. Sure, um, and if I could just clarify, everyone, you've got to what we've got to realize in the state of Florida is our buildings are essentially large, hard, gray sponges, and we are in an extremely corrosive environment. Um, so until you actually get to the true bones, the steel inside that concrete, you don't really have a good idea of what you are dealing with. So unfortunately, concrete restoration is the one, Division 3000 is the one aspect of the scope that is extremely difficult to define. Um, but when you get to other projects like rooftop replacements, uh, common area modernizations, gym modernizations, lobby renovations, that sort of thing, those are more of a capped function. Even with an amenities deck, there's a certain amount of paving, a certain square footage that you can cap those portions of the, uh, of the project. It's the unforeseen, the things that we can't see, that x-ray can't see, just like it can't see, just like when you go into the doctor, that are the difficult portion to define. Now, Colliers, as, a, as your owner's representative, is really there to hold the parties accountable to the contract. So when we come across these unforeseen conditions, we're ensuring that 
the number of workmen on, on site is validated by a backup of a logbook. The, the number of days or work or amount of work that has been conducted has been validated by the engineer and or the inspector on site. We're not just blindly signing additive change orders and or not validating that that change order is compliant with the contract. So enforcement of the contract is ideally really there to help you in those scenarios that gives you the ability to validate and negotiate those change orders before just paying them. And that's really where you need to rely on your owner rep um, and your engineer um, with regard to um, coordinating and dealing with those contractors in those scenarios. That's a great point. And to kind of expand on that, one of the questions that came through, um, you know, we, we talked about a couple different items now, which are, you know, uh, expansion joints and, and you know, a, a big amenity deck, you know, pavers and things. You know, some of our buildings that are here in South Florida, they're doing multiple projects, roofs, elevators, uh, PT cables, post-tension cables, amenity yep. decks. You know, and say that they've done, um, you know, a, a special assessment, they've collected the monies for these, and it's a three, five, seven year kind of time span to get these projects done. You know, from a, from a recommendation standpoint, you obviously want some consistency of the project manager, but does it make sense to bring somebody in-house, maybe work for the management company at the property versus a uh, Collier's that maybe has some... Um, additional resources in all of because those are very different projects. An elevator yeah. modification is different than a amenity deck. So having a single point of contact may not have all the, the specifications necessary, or they may, but it, it could be a little bit uh, of a challenge. What are your thoughts on in-house or? You know, we get, we get asked the same question in, in the commercial environment as well. And it really is dependent on the threshold. Obviously, you want your employee to be, to to have a full forty hour, fifty hour work week, um, and you know a condominium association, much like a hotel, is an occupied asset. Um, so, from that perspective, it's not like new construction or an apartment building that you can completely vacate and immediately team up. Uh, man up the project with as much labor as possible and coordinate succinctly the varying parties that would come on board to do a roof replacement, an RTU replacement, come down the tower and then, so to say, back out the building and come through the amenities deck and the lobbies and work their way out of the building. In these occupied communities, you don't necessarily always have a threshold of that size project going at any single one time. An amenities deck, for instance, you know, might only require a, a, the administrative commitment of about two days a week. And you're not going to go through an amenities deck, lobby renovation, common area modernization, and a gym renovation all at the same time because your residents will probably hang you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, you you really want to coordinate that, that level of... Um, pain or inconvenience within your, um, your living environment and phase a project. You know, you never want to do the deck if the tower needs a renovation because you're going to um, mess up the finishes there on your new deck while you're repainting and restoring your tower. So you, you typically, from a golden rule of thumb, will work outside in. And that doesn't necessarily always require a full-time commitment. And that's, that's a very good point. Or we also, from the... the residential management side, we also have our, uh, our our board members that either did some form of, uh, you know, maybe management or know somebody has a brother-in-law that used to work in construction that, you know, they want to offer up the help, you know, from a liability standpoint, from a, um, you know, insurance standpoint, what are your thoughts on you know, having a board member or a maybe residents within the community act as that kind of project manager or maybe even liaison with, with the owner's rep? I mean, read Senate Bill 4D and 154. It'll explain the liability. Um, since the passing of that, of that reform um, and bill, uh, the personal liability on, on board members 
has greatly increased. Um, I don't think there's coverage for some of the things that, uh, or insurance coverage for that perspective, um, to where if decisions are made that negatively affect um, the value of a unit, um, there's potential for personal lawsuit by residents on board members if decisions are made that, that negatively affect the, the ability of them to maybe even trade a unit um, and things of that nature. So, you know, really in, in the current environment, board members, I urge board members to lean on professionals that do this every day um, and do it for a living because ideally the, the litigious environment for and, and personal exposure for board members has significantly increased in the passing of this latest legislation. No, I agree. And uh, so it, it, it's as much as they want to help, there's also other avenues of, you know, either committees or um, liaison to the board. Because one of the things that we've talked about and, and Scott and I have done uh, other webinars as SB4D was working its way through the system. And, um, and it talks about bringing all of your partners around the table early. Um, so, you know, Scott has done, uh, and, and building maintenance have done a number of the milestone one, milestone two inspections, start working on the, the SERS um, uh, uh, reports, you know, and so it's being able to sit around the table early and often to make sure that the expectation is done. So Scott, as you've been ramping up with more buildings doing the, the milestone inspections, you know, are they... And, and I know one of the fun questions that, that you always got posed was, you know, well, how many buildings are going to naturally go to the milestone two? And, you know, how does an engineer not just instantly do that? You know, as we as you started to see more and more buildings, um, you know, going from either milestone one to milestone two, and then, you know, what are the repair protocols starting to look like? Because I think that's where the partnership really forms between the, the engineer, the board, management, and, you know, the overall community. Well, we had, we had a healthy little debate about this behind the scenes, but um, you know, as as we we talk about the existing buildings, and I think the key there is just getting the 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 individual in early, whether it's colliers or whether it's the the engineer or so forth, because if you need a phase two, or you need projects down the line, you can know that with a quick walk around the building before hiring an engineer to come on board and do a full phase one to tell you that and you outlay capital that you could have put towards something else, right? So in, in terms of, 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 um, of Greg, if he's on site already and he's working on other things and he understands the, the laws for milestones, understands what the service is for, understands how everything links together, then he could be able to tell the owner, well, before we jump into requesting a milestone just to put it in the budget, let's really think about what the, the property is going to undergo through the process. Because if you do have spalling on balconies, you do have significant damage on property, you know, concrete spalls falling from underneath plaza decks, waterproofing issues, roof replacements, then you shouldn't be concerned about your phase one cost. You should be concerned about timelines and true budgets for construction and, and securing funds for that. So you don't want to, to miss the true picture of things by just focusing on the, the law saying, well, you need a milestone report by X date, which may be you know, two years down the road. And so you, you actually miss the whole intention of the law. Right, that's a, that's a very good point. I think you know, intent and, and none of us uh, that I'm aware of are, are attorneys, so we, we won't pretend to be an attorney, but you know, the intent of the law is to protect this major asset for for the homeowners which are you know the, the the stakeholders and you know unfortunately what we've seen is you know there's been a lot of deferred maintenance you know they've pushed off different uh maintenance things and I, and I use this in a lot of our our discussions is that and Greg I think you mentioned it you know the the buildings are living breathing uh wearable structures they're not this permanent thing that is going to be there for hundreds of years, if not properly maintained. Um, you know, concrete in the, the salt air environment is um, absorbs the salt water. And if, you know, you have waterproofing under a pool, well, that only has a certain useful life that after, you know, 5, 10, 20 years, whatever that is, starts to deteriorate. Now you're getting chlorinated water that is permeating through the concrete. 
So I equate a building much like a, an automobile. You have to change the oil. You have to rotate the tires, change the tires, add new brakes, new washer fluid. It's a, there's a lot of wearable items. And that's where, you know, we really wanted to kind of take this property management versus project management discussion, because a lot of these items, you know, the property manager should, you know, have routine maintenance and things that are happening uh, for the community. It's making sure that the, the cooling towers, you know, uh, doing what it needs to do. The pumps are, are keeping the pressure up. You have a boiler that's keeping the water up. But when it morphs into a major undertaking, and we've used amenity decks and, and expansion joints and major um, leaks and, and things that we've had with, with Ian, a owner's rep working with the engineer uh, is probably one of the most important decisions that a board can make because you're bringing the expertise. And you know, between you know, Collier's and the engineers coming together, being able to design and work through a, could be 12, 15, 18, could be even longer month project, uh, you, you wanna make sure that you have the right qualifications, the right uh, licenses that most property managers don't have. And Greg, you mentioned this before, you know, the liability now of getting some of these things um, through the new statute, it's gone are the days of just, you know, a board member being able to kind of push off a, a task. So I want to kind of talk through, you know, when a property manager and we start talking about these projects and we reach out to an engineer and we reach out, you know, what do some of those initial conversations with a board kind of revolve around? So we know what the project is. We, we're sitting with Scott and we know that it's a, and I'll go back to concrete restoration. They've, they've done their initial Milestone one, milestone two, you know, when, when should we bring, you know, you and your firm in as we start to look at those repair protocols to make sure that we're doing everything in the right order sequence, you know, and I keep looking at the, the, the term schedule on here, because I think that's probably the most important thing, because it's, it's a living, breathing building, and we have living, breathing people in the building, and it's always going to impact their life. Yeah, it really depends on the age of the building and the stage of, of the assignment. We, we typically like to get involved right at the inception of a project, i.e. we need to RFP for milestone and SIRS. Um, because obviously in the market, you have engineers that are fully qualified to do the milestone, but then from a SIRS perspective, might not necessarily have the coverage of all the disciplines within their umbrella. Um, so you've actually got multiple parties that may be needed in order to facilitate a milestone and a SERS investigation. Um, you know, so at that same point, uh, in most of the communities that we, we help, they've already got some form of assignment ongoing. Um, you know, we, it's, it's really the older buildings that haven't done the preventative maintenance where they may have that three to five, they're going through an ELSS, a pool upgrade, uh, a garage restoration, the tower needs a 50 year certification and there's just, everything needs to be done. Um, and so that is more of a sort of full-time commitment, but to really answer your question, we assist the, the community with the RFPing of the milestone uh, and the SERS. Um, and then if that goes into a phase two, um, we obviously ensure that the scope is being covered by, by the engineer on the milestone. Um, we assist with definement of the scope. Um, typically, there's going to be that first phase discovery and uh, the second phase, which I'll let Scott get into, uh, is going to be a, more of a destructive uh, undertaking to fully or at least more completely understand the challenges that the building would be facing in a restoration, um, in a restoration undertaking to meet the milestone. Now, you know, once that discovery comes back, you've heard that, that big scary term, unforeseen condition. Um, and, you know, in some cases we've seen examples where um, there's not really a bunch of care or consideration taken for the full quantity or the full expectation of quantity. Um, as an example, uh, 
square footage of full depth replacement of concrete in, in a project, right? Um, or stucco replacement. In some bid forms, you might see only a 100 square foot expectation when um, there may be uh, convincing um, proof that it is far greater than that. The building may have 60,000 square foot of stucco, it's probably 5,000 square foot of repair, but the bid package goes out to market with 100 square foot to gain a unit price. And that those bidders, unfortunately, have no idea on what the expectation might be and have bid that project on a low number, not thinking that it's going to be a five or a 10 or a 15,000 square foot expectation. And Scott, I, I, I'd lean, lean to you to... Um, you maybe elaborate on that point because that's a risk profile that unfortunately a lot of buildings are, are coming across and maybe how you you can uh, sort of set them up for success in that in that environment oh well i, I think um you know in the industry right like you said we, we talked about this back in in on the um in the, in the behind the scenes the, the range of fees for professionals vary greatly sometimes right and if a board hires an engineer and says, well, I got a deal, <laughs> then probably they got a deal because the professional is not going to spend as much time reviewing the property, right? Or if, if they're not looking closely at scope, one engineer says, well, we're going to assess all the balconies. One says, we'll just walk around the building, right? So when they get their, their let's call it scope of repair or quantities and so on, there may be a lot of holes and if they say, well, thank you, engineer, um, we're going to bid this ourselves, and they go bid it, and the contractors jump all over that and say, you know, well, listen, there's going to be lots of chances here to make a lot of money because it's not a very tight scope. And, yep. this, and this is, I'm not, it's not, I'm not making this stuff up, right? This is the- No, usual. not at all. You're, you're, I'm leading right? the witness, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so now the contractor bids. And as soon as he gets on site, there's a change order of, that's 50% of the project now, right? So the project ballooned very quickly. So, you know, as we talked back behind scenes, the, the way to calculate the cost of professionals and so on usually comes down to time and their hourly rate, right? So there's not usually that much variation between hourly rates. So the question should be, well, how are you going to do this assessment? And if we're going to look at all the balconies and we're going to do a thorough assessment, that will lead to a more thorough set of plans, right? Yep. And a good engineer will tell you that they have to see X amount. And you may say, well, I don't like you because your cost is too high. I'm going to go with this guy. And that sends the cart down the wrong street. So I think to, to really set things up correctly, you have to lean on the professionals, right? You have to make sure that they are truly advising you correctly. And by getting the right, let's say, property manager, project manager, attorney, everybody involved, they will be leaning on each professional and you'll have a good flow of information that you are covered to the best you can. And that's really how you set up the project for success because nobody is going to promise that there's not going to be any type of, um, like there's not going to be any unforeseen circumstances. However, when it does come up, the frequency can be limited. And also you can have contingencies in the contract that cover that and lock the contractor in and so forth that you are protected to the best of the, the industry standard to do it. And, and I think that's what people need to focus on is setting up the project for success because you really save money on the construction side, not on the upfront with your professionals. And what sort of, sorry, Brian, because this is a, an all reaching question. What sort of contingencies do you, are, you, are you typically recommending, Scott, in the in the sort of unforeseen line items, at least? <laughs> Way to lock them in the, there, Greg. Yeah, no, this is great because because okay, so the, no, it's it's spring, even though we had the besides the scenes. No, 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 this, this, this is good. This is like, good. I'm, I'm at like thirty to thirty thirty to forty percent sometimes on a on a resto project. Just putting it out there. Right. So but here, on, a, on an interior lobby, I'm at like ten to fifteen percent contingency. Well, well, here's here's the real answer, because as 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 a president of an association that was putting contingencies into budgets and they're like, why would we need a contingency? Oh, my God. You know, so like the contingency <laughs> is is whatever you want it to be. Right. Yeah, it is because you could, you, could, you could pad it and go up to 30 percent and say we, this is going to really cover us and we may have extra funds and and 
and and a prudent person may say, well, that's that makes us sleep better at night. Somebody else might say, well, why do we need to go to 30? It should be around 20. We can live with that. But what you don't want to do is say something like, why do we need a contingency? Right? <laughs> Like, you yeah. don't, you know, you don't want to put it down to 5% or so on. You want it to be reasonable and, and you want to listen to the professionals on that. And, and like, like Greg said, in concrete restoration, the, the contingency will be larger than a plaza deck where most things are visual and you can already see it's going to be this amount of square foot and so forth. But it, it, it's not wise to forego contingencies and, and put other, um, not fluff, but let's call it other smart decisions into the budget that are not just the hard cost items, because that's what really will set you up again for success. That's a, that's a really good point. And I think you guys are all going back to the old adage that you get what you pay for. And, you know, making sure that you have the right engineer, the right, uh, you know, project manager will be able to walk through all these things. And listen, most contractors are going to put you know, certain terms that, that protect them, uh, you know, from, from these things, knowing that they're going to start peeling back the, the curtain and unforeseen circumstances are going to come up. So they're going to cover themselves because, you know, they've been um, mistreated as well in the past. And, you know, where, you know, a board or a, a commercial space didn't want to pay for certain services, didn't think they were needed. Um, so I absolutely agree that, you know, from a, bringing in the right team, you know, a qualified engineer, which, you know, one of the questions I saw come up, you know, MEP, you know, mechanical electrical plumbing. Well, you know, I'm, technically I'm a civil engineer. I'm an underground drainage. So bringing me in for a MEP project is not the right decision. So it's making sure you're bringing in the right people and the right quality qualified individual. Same thing on the owner's rep side of things that, that has, so as you're, interviewing people and you're bringing people on, you know, make sure that it's not just about what that bottom right-hand corner of the, the fee proposal looks like, where it's going to be, you know, X number of dollars per hour, make sure they have the right licensure, make sure they have the right qualifications. They've done these types of projects in the past because, well, go ahead, Scott. Uh, yeah, I want, I want to, because, you know, and just Let's, let's be, be real in the sense of how things happen and, and maybe work backwards. So what usually happens in the industry right now is the board member or individual or property manager will liaise with a product rep or contractor for something, right? And the, they will come in for a specific task. And so um, if for, let's, let's talk about, let's say, roofing, right? Oh, you know, we really should do a roof. So you call a contractor in. And he comes in and he says, well, I'm just going to top it with silicone, right? And you say, this is great. It falls into budget and we pay for it. And then you bring another one. Well, a resident complained about this area above the pool. Okay, bring in a guy. He does it. But what they don't realize is when they're doing that, these contractors aren't really going to look at the building and say, you know what? Um, you shouldn't do your roof right now because you have a, a huge spall in your garage that needs to be repaired. So the point is if you go to the, the cart first, you're going to end up with, with issues. So if you start with Greg or a professional involved and they oversee the property and look at things, they can now sequence things in a way that you're not going to be redoing work. Because like, like Greg said, if you do the deck first and then paint and you have splatter everywhere, then you're going to have unforeseen costs to clean up deck and maybe other damage to the deck that you just did. So you really want true guidance through sequencing of projects, through the actual getting uh, funding and bringing in the parties at the right time so they have the specific scopes of what they're doing. And that really is the best way to the end, not trying to just pick the, the a la carte approach because the, the building needs to be sequenced. And that's why in the commercial world, it's not done that way because they have these capital improvement plans from, from the inception of purchase to the, the full life of holding the asset. Correct, Greg? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even... even We'll, we'll simplify it even more. Think of buying a, a single family residence as opposed to a condo. You get an inspection of that residence, which inspects the roof, the AC, the water heater, the windows, the hurricane uh, preparedness of that structure before you will ever get financing on it because you need to get insurance in order to get the financing. Um, and when we go and buy a condo, personally, you're only looking at the four walls of that condo and maybe the sliders and the windows, 
the AC and the, uh, and the ability to supply hot water. You're not looking at the roof of the condo. You're not looking at the amenities deck or, or whether the building's been adequately maintained. And a prime example you know, of, of this is, is an engineered life safety systems upgrade. Um, you've got hundreds of these that are going to be need to need to be done throughout the state. Um, and, you know, this is where we're really meant to team up with property management because property management doesn't necessarily understand the concurrencies of the systems that are going to be affected in an ELSS upgrade. Um, you know, we've got folks that went down a line of getting a whole a sprinkler system installed without realizing that they would need an architect to design a soffit, to relocate uh, signage for e means of egress. And not only that, but then it involved the, the smoke dampers and, and really exhausting the building uh, of smoke in a fire scenario. So there were multiple parties that, that didn't get engaged until 80% completion of the sprinkler system and they realized that they needed everything else to get done. So, you know, it, it's really relying on, on your, your experts to be able to completely scope the project, hopefully, before you, you start. No, that's, that's really good. And actually, one of the questions that came in, because we kind of, I guess, danced around all the, the tasks and um, the responsibilities of, of the owner rep. Um, you know, one of the questions, again, you know, define owner's, representative. And the, the way that I like to look at it is obviously we're the property manager, we're managing the day-to-day -day aspect. And what I'm looking for from an owner's rep is somebody, a firm a person that is an advocate for the association. They have the qualifications for the project. They have worked in the industry in the past and they help manage the project from the very early stages, even pre- uh, you know, pre-budget, because we've also had boards that said, well, a, a building down the street did conquer restoration. It cost them $5 million, but their building, you know, the building they live in is twice the bit, twice the size and twice the, the width, but they think the same budget is going to, uh, to apply. So the owner's rep in my world is somebody that is going to work with the, the association and be an advocate for the association and the vendors that are going to be doing all the work, and which is why you know, uh, you know, great for your, you know, slide here, uh, you're kind of right in the middle. You're bringing all these different resources together to make sure that it's a successful project because you have the different skill sets, the different experiences, and the ability to ensure that a project is a success. Absolutely, our fiduciary responsibility with both commercial and even residential HOA is to the success of the project. And ultimately, we are responsible for defining the cost and time associated with each one of those parties. And that is only a small subset, a 55,000 foot view of the coordinative requirements and responsibilities of those parties. And not only that, but we have to keep ownership um, on task because contractually, if ownership does not adequately respond to any of those parties in this sort of hierarchical um, structure, then we are technically in default of contract. Um, and they all affect your scope, schedule, and budget in some way, shape, or form that needs to be documented and communicated amongst those parties. Because if there is any breakdown on communication, unfortunately, it's gonna come back and re-affect those three items time and time again. That's, that's a great point. Um, you know, one, another question came up and, and Greg, I know you touched about uh, on this, you know, about the liability. They were asking if a board member should be the owner's rep. Absolutely not. I mean, <laughs> if you want, uh, you know, the one thing that we're taught in this business, Brian and Scott will tell you is conflict of interest. We're dealing with, con with contracts, right? And if, if you put yourself in a position where even as a board member, for instance, you didn't, you didn't, you chose not to do the re-roof when the insurer told you it needed to be a complete re-roof and therefore you couldn't find insurance and therefore 
um, condos in the building couldn't trade. Um, you know, that's liability right there. If someone, if someone loses money or can't make a transaction because of decisions um, of, of members of the board or, or those in the positions of power, then unfortunately there's liability there. Oh, very true. So um, as we kind of wind down with the last, you know, 15 minutes or so of our, of our presentation, you know, Scott, with all the new legislative laws that are happening, what are some of the challenges you're seeing out in the industry? And then uh, Greg asked the same question from, you know, some of the projects that are going to be coming up. So Scott, with the, obviously things are changing. There's some um, time horizons that are out there. What are some of the uh, challenges that, that you and your firm have been starting to see with, uh, with our boards, with the buildings? Things of that nature. Um, I, I think it's 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 a shift of mindset right now because I think there is is there is still a resistance in a sense of well, do we really have to do this right, or how long can we push it off? And so the what I've seen so far is the prudent boards are, have already secured engineers. Um, in in Palm Beach County, there's already a website where you can upload your milestone. And so the boards that are proud of their building have been maintaining it well or, yeah, sure, come on in. They've passed the phase one and we've submitted reports for them and, and they're on their way, right? So they're no longer thinking about, well, what is this milestone thing? What am I, do I have to do it or not? So I think the challenge right now is to get rid of the old mindset because that's why we're in the position we're in. And yes, there's going to be increased costs. Yes, you may have to go into major work. And the, the decision is not to ignore it, but how do you position yourself now that you can streamline it and essentially have the most cost-effective approach, approach through it instead of, well, let's put it off because I've always I've been saying this, but time is not, is not our friend at this point because even if we think we have... Um, a year and a half left. Just the nature of the business is it takes a couple months or so to get the engineer involved, whether we have a good RFP or not, right? Because there's decisions, there's board meetings, there's all this different stuff. Then the engineer may take a couple months or a month to do his work and then to spec repairs, maybe another month. And then to get a contract on board, maybe another two months and to start repairs, maybe a month after that, because there's contract negotiation. So you're really looking at the beginning of next year to even start work if you already know who you want to hire. And, and that's the reality. So I think the challenge right now is to, is to stop delaying and to, to essentially face the music. And if you have issues at the building, get them looked at because it doesn't get better. Right. The, the duct tape can't work anymore. The, 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 <laughs> like you said, the board member saying I'm going to be the PM or the, the maintenance guy being the concrete restoration guy or the property manager being the engineer, like all that stuff doesn't work anymore. And it's now being really um, hampered on in the sense that there will be lawsuits against board members. There'll be all these different things going on if it's not done correctly. And at the end of the day, it's not worth it. Right. Just do it right. It is what it is. And let's move forward. I think that's really where, where we're at right now. Totally, totally agree. Um, you know, and I think uh, the one thing from a property management standpoint uh, that we've appreciated is it allows, you know, as, as much as we've gone to our boards and saying, board, uh, there's, a, there's a roof leak, there's, a, there's an issue here, and the board's maybe kicking the can down, they didn't want to raise assessments. We, as property managers, now have a little bit more teeth that we can, you know, warn the boards that there are some, some hefty liability things happening now. Um, that you need to make the right decision moving forward. Um, you know, and Greg, I'll, I'm going to come back to some of the challenges. Actually, one of the things that came up, and, and Scott, you just kind of mentioned this, a lot of contracts, a lot of things happening. So after you do the, um, you know, the inspections, what about construction lawyers? Obviously, each association should have its own um, you know, legal counsel that's op opining on various uh, you know, property management laws and 718 and 719, things like that. But as we work into the construction side, bringing on the owner's rep, what is, where's the, the line drawn of, you know, owner's rep helping negotiate the contract and then a construction lawyer, or, or is there? So we, we are there to, to assist in definement of scope and what sort of traditional means and method expectations are in market. Um, attorneys should be brought in on each one of the contracts that you're negotiating with hard and soft, hard, hard meaning contractors, subcontractors, soft consultants, meaning 
myself, Scott, the engineers, the MEP, um, all of them should be looked at from a liability, professional and general liability and insurance aspect. Um, so attorney comes in right at the beginning. Uh, project manager is really there to help you define the scope obligations of the contract because he's going to have to enforce them. Um, a lot of folks make that mistake. That's one thing I do want to bring up, Brian, is they make that mistake that they don't bring the project manager in until the work is almost about to start and there's a kickoff meeting. And then we as project managers literally have to go back. And I hate to say the word discovery like a, like a lawyer, but that first 60 days is literally going back and reviewing every single document that was signed because now the responsibility lies on us to enforce it. <laughs> right. Yeah, <laughs> so. that's, that's definitely a big challenge. And, you know, sometimes, which honestly was the impetus behind this webinar is bringing in that you, that person in early, because exactly. you know, you've already developed the schedule, you've already developed the, a budget and this overall scope, but maybe you had blinders on and you, you missed a very large component. You missed how certain things should be done where can you kind of turn the screws if needed? Where can you make sure that you hold them accountable? I think that probably is one of the larger challenges, uh, you know, from a, from a property management standpoint and an owner's rep standpoint, um, you know, and making sure that we're, we're engaging our partners early in, in the process. And, uh, and so, sorry, if, if I could mention, Scott, the one point that you made through this, you know, it's no good kicking the, this can down the road, unfortunately. Um, we've all seen in the last 36 months what inflation has done, cost of concrete. Um, this, you know, if, if you're successful in pushing off your structural integrity reserve study for, for a requirement of a fulfillment for 12 months, guess what? You're still going to have to fill it in 12 months' time and you're still going to have to go through a concrete restoration project. So, you know, you're only, in my mind, delaying the inevitable and that's more reactive than proactive um so i would heed the warning that scott uh, gave out there um get on it there's also very limited engineers in the market as well at the moment so the sooner you get on it um and the sooner you you get a you get a partner in in those undertakings the more the more likelihood of success you'll have yeah, so, and, and just briefly back to the, the contracts, because I want to add this in. You, you do not want to sign on, on a construction project, big or small, the, the contractor's contract. It's, that's just bad practice. And, and here's why, because they're writing the contract to protect them. So when you say, oh, my goodness, this, this thing ballooned. Well, yeah, because they probably put in there that they have the right to do this and know what, what protection do you have? So the, the best practice about the construction attorney or, or the association's attorney is they look at all the contracts, like Greg says, if, they're, if you are a, a, um, a very savvy association, they just slap an addendum to a professional contract and that covers it. I, I hate them, but that's, that's good on their part. But on the, the bigger thing, the construction side is they will write a standard contract and the contractor will sign that and that protects mm -hmm. And, and, and that I've seen many times being fall back on when things go wrong. And it's good that we had the contract as opposed to the other way where I've seen an association sign the contractor's contract. And they say, well, you shouldn't do this. And he says, well, look, it says I can. And they're like, oh my God, what? So that, that's not where you, <laughs> <Find> that. <laughs> yeah, that's not what, where you want to be, right? So like, again, resist the do-it-yourself approach. Yes, you may have very smart board members. Yes, you may be very smart. You may be very, very smart property manager. You may be the smartest guy in the block. However, it, that's not gonna be helpful going forward because all of us have our, our, our role. And when we play the role right and you have the right partners, that's when it's successful. Not when somebody is trying to wear five different hats or, right. or trying to cut costs. So I think, you know, just the theme is get the right professionals in, get on track quickly and, and start moving along towards the actual true finish, which is to have a really good plan in place and projects done. And now you're on track along with your SERS and everything that you now have a property that's being maintained correctly. And, um, and that will build property values and, and be, be good for all things insurance related. So it, it really is a benefit to the condominium and, and the residents. You know, Scott, it's a, it's a good point. And, and with the you know, last couple of minutes, one of the questions that came in, and, and it's a great point, it actually wasn't even a question, it was more of a, a comment. And I think this is where 
uh, the true value of the owner's rep. And I've used the term partnership uh, a lot during this presentation because we are where it's a little bit different than the commercial space in, in the residential space, you're in people's homes. You may be doing work on their balcony. You have to go through their unit. So overall communication is probably the number one uh, uh, component of any of these projects. You know, from, you know, from the engineering standpoint, you may be meeting with the contractor and looking through what they're working on, obviously with the owner's rep input, the engineer is gonna be providing, um, you know, various reports, but from the owner's rep standpoint with the property manager, it's it could be multiple reports in a given week. We're moving from stack A to stack B or one to two. Could be we're moving up a floor or it could be we're going to you know enter units 101, 102 and 103. And how do we stay on track? How do we communicate with those owners that could be living there or maybe even uh, you know snowbirds that are away? So how do we make sure? So you know, we'll end on, you know, uh, maybe Greg, what's your typical communication pattern to show? Because it's, it's different. You have the board communication pattern than maybe a resident communication pattern. Yeah. So, I mean, just from a standard practice, we're on on 90% of our projects, we're running weekly meetings with property managers. We obviously have our, our construction meeting with the, the GC or the contractors on site, but we're actually having Another what we call OAC meeting, which is owner and owner engineer, property manager, and typically a board member, um, and that's on a weekly basis, right? And in our standard practice, obviously that produces weekly meeting minutes with any updates to budget, scope, and schedule that would happen for that week. Um, that is run up into an executive summary um, that ultimately we'll sit down with the board prior to a typical once a month town hall. Um, and go through what aspects of the project are going to affect the residents. And we will physically sit there and communicate with the residents and the board the functions of the next sort of 30 days. If it is a very intrusive project where, like you mentioned, there's going to be intrusion into a unit and you've got to put up those weather walls and, and balcony work is going to be done, we typically would up the communication style to a two week look ahead where. Um, there's a board or a placard down in, in the lobby that is defining which lines or which floors, as you mentioned, are going to be affected during that, that coming week. But that is sort of standard expectation, standard practice. And, and that's great. And Scott, what about yourself? I know you typically, uh, during construction, the engineer is still involved, but maybe not on a, a daily basis. They're doing kind of weekly check-ins. What's your communication style back to the owner's rep and to you know maybe the board or the property manager? Well, well, you'd, you'd want the weekly reports. And let's say we're doing weekly visits or bi-weekly visits. The, the, the time frame of each inspection, what we've looked at, we want to send that in to, to the, pro the, pro the project manager who will now, I guess, compile his full report. But it will show what the progress of work is, if there's any reason that we suspect there's a change order, if, if what things have been compliant, what things are non-compliant. And again, it, it all depends on what the setup for the project is, but a good one will have the, the, the concurrent meetings that are going on. We'll have meeting minutes and everything will be a nice package to, to the owners so that they can understand the, the project on a whole in a very digestible way. Yeah, I think, uh, and that's a great way to, to wrap it all up as we hitting our, our mark here. Um, you know, it, it's, we can't stress it enough. I think we've said it a, a number of times, start early. There's, we're going to run out of engineers, run out of contractors with a lot of the work that's happening, no matter even if you bring them on and do the milestone inspections, even having the right materials and the right contractors. So highly recommended that you start this process early for any of these projects, bringing in your partners, sitting around a table early, making sure that you're comfortable. And that, that includes the attorney, um, even banking relationships. Obviously, some of these big projects are going to be multi-million dollar projects bringing in your banking relationship and your banking partners to make sure how are we going to collect the funds so that everybody can get paid. And, you know, if it's a special assessment, a lot of times you can roll the cost of the soft costs, as Greg mentioned, into the special assessment. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, if I could make one comment, um, you know, for any board members that are out there or even the property managers that can educate their board members or board presidents, 
you've got two distinctive paths for the projects that are undertaking significant uh, restorations. And I'm talking multi-million dollar, just like you said, Brian. It, you know, for this is going to have a great effect on the state of Florida and the ability of folks to stay in their in their units and in their condos. And that is the board to be able to leverage um, financing on behalf of the residents. Um, if it, dependent on the affluency of the community, their ability to. Um, it is going to be a far easier undertaking for a community as a whole to leverage the debt market and be able to pay for these assessments rather than relying on your own individual unit owners to go and find a personal line of credit or a HELOC on a unit than the community going and doing it for them. The more buildings that go the latter route and push their residents to find their own money, the higher propensity for failure. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And with that, I think we, we've crossed over the 1 p.m. Eastern mark. So I just want to take the uh, last you know, 30 seconds to, to thank our, our panelists, Greg and Scott. Uh, hopefully this information has been valuable. Our information is uh, on the screen. And again, call, reach out, uh, start the, the process early. Um, you know, one of the final questions was, you know, at what point do we bring somebody in? Bring somebody in, make the phone call, because if it's a small renovation project that may not necessitate a, a full owner's rep, at least we can guide you along that direction. All Because it really all depends on what skills does your property manager have if it's a small renovation project versus something that's a little bit larger uh, where you need a pole engineer and, and does it touch the mechanical equipment or just a, a small, you know, tile replacement in a lobby, things like that. And in some cases, we're actually helping communities define on whether they are putting themselves up for sale and redevelopment or not as well. So right. if there's any of the, those trepidatious decisions, we are there to, to assist and help. Absolutely. So again, I want to thank Greg, Scott. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for everybody that attended and have a wonderful rest of the week. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Castle. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Nice being here.